Thank you everybody for joining us for tonight's volleyball presentation for Officiate Michigan Day. Uh, it is entitled The Responsibilities and Mechanics of MHSAA Line Judges, and your presenter for this evening will be Kent Neitzer. Kent is a longtime coach and official uh, in the state of Michigan, uh, and uh, he is going to present tonight's program. I'll turn it over to Kent. Thanks, Brent. As Brent said, I've been, um, I've been playing the game for over 50 years. I've coached it for over 40 years and officiated it getting close to uh, 30 years now. I started officiating at the college level while I was coaching the high school and officiated at the high school level, level since 2008. Um, so I have a lot of experience uh, and I've made a lot of mistakes throughout the time. So uh, one of the things we have to understand as an official is we're going to make mistakes and uh, we're going to have to live with them. So um, we're going to start with this presentation on line judging. Let me see if I can get the slides to advance. Uh, come on. There we go. One of the things we need to realize is that every volleyball match involves three teams. There's the home team, there's the visiting team, and from our standpoint, the officiating team. And the officiating team is composed of an R1 who controls the entire match. Their specific responsibilities are for calling the legality of ball handling but they can make any decisions throughout the, of anything throughout the match. There's the R2 or the down official. Their primary responsibility is for watching for net violations and center line violations, but they also need to assist R1 in ball handling violations because there are times when R1 is screened from a play and needs help. Their other responsibility is handling the table and any requests coming from the bench, such as timeouts and substitutions and uh, the conduct of the bench personnel. We have a scorekeeper and an assistant scorekeeper, sometimes referred to as the Libro tracker. Their job is to keep a factual record of what happens during a match. So if there's a question as to whether a point was scored or a player was in the match, we should be able to go back to that official record and find out what the truth of the situation is. The other part of the officiating crew are the line judges. And just because they're listed last year doesn't mean they're any less important than the rest of the officials. We need to understand that this officiating team is an entire team. The line judges are in place to assist the R1 in uh, making a calls with respect to their, what their re responsibilities are. Their calls are to help R1 and R2 make a final decision, but their input is not the final decision in itself. The final decision rests with R1. Keep in mind that the R1 can accept your call or overrule the call. They may have something that they're calling that preempts your call, they may see something that's different from your call. And we need to understand that even at the college level and international levels, we now have replay involved. Uh, the coaches have a card at the end of the score table, a green card that they can pick up and challenge any call that happens during that particular rally. Uh, they get in, in college ranks, they get three challenges per match. Uh, and if they disagree with any call that the R1 comes up with, they can challenge that call. And then they go to instant replay and look at the replay and try and make a decision. And if you watched uh, replays happen, you know, uh, if you watch Major League Baseball, you see umpires coaches challenging plays and umpires overturning calls. And I would dare say that those play umpires and officials are more 
trained in their craft than we probably are in ours. So don't think that if you get overruled as a line judge, that that's uh, something uh, that you need to get upset about. We've all watched magicians do sleight of hands and make a coin disappear. We know it's in the left hand. And when they show you the left hand, it's not there. It's because our eyes deceive us. And in the volleyball match, there are times when our eyes and brains deceive us and there we make a wrong call. And if the R1, it's their responsibility. If they see, if you call the ball in and they see it in their opinion out, their responsibility is to go with an out call. And we need to, as line judges, understand that I thought I saw what I saw, but R1 has to take the heat. I kiddingly tell my line judges frequently that don't get upset if I overrule you once. If I overrule you five times, you can stomp off the court, but leave the flag because we got to have somebody to replace you. During the warm up period, there are some responsibilities the line judges have. We need to be there approximately 30 minutes before the warm left on the warm up clock, maybe even a little, let, uh, a little sooner than that, because that's about the time that the, the officials are going to call the coaches for their coin flip. Um, each line judge should be assigned by the R1 to a particular corner. Uh, the R1 may not have a preference and allow you to make that decision on your own, uh, but it, sometimes they do have a preference. One thing to remember, if you are being the R1 at a match, you need to talk to your line judges and tell them what you expect of them because we're gonna be working as a team and we've gotta be on the same page to start with. During this discussion with the R1, which is generally takes place off the main court someplace, maybe behind the table, perhaps if you had a pre, if you met in the locker room, you can do that at that time. It's a good time for you as a line judge to clear up question, any questions you might have uh, because you will find that certain R1s want different things from you than the, than the R1 that you had the previous night. So just what do you want me to do if I think the ball is down and I call it down and you go on with play? How do you want me to handle that? The line judges are defined, defined by called line judge one or, and line judge two, or just L1 and L2. The L1 is the line judge, it's on R1 side of the court and L2 is on the R2 side of the court, just for reference. During the warm up period, the line judges should not be in front of the scores table or near either team bench. You wanna be out of the way so that the R2 and the coaches can do what they need to be doing in front of the table. This is a good time for the line judges to familiarize themselves with the surroundings and the play of the ball. It's a good idea for the line judges to take their corner positions between the 12 minute mark and the four minute mark on the warm up clock. That way you watch each team warm up during one four minute interval. You can see how the balls look as they cross the end lines. You may find that your lines are not real distinct from the surrounding court. There may be a glare, there may be a window and light shining through it and you can't hardly see a line. Get to know that before the match starts. During the introductions, the officials sort of stand on their sidelines facing the court. This is something that uh, is different from what you'll see in the National Federation books, but the uh, MHSAA, MHSAA has decided that this is the way we're going to do it. So during the, just before the introduction in the national anthem, the R1 and the L1 should walk across the court and the R2 and L2 stay at the table side. Uh, L1 should uh, take their flag and a ball if we're using a three ball retriever system where we have shaggers and place it on the official stand. If we're using a four ball system, then the L1 takes two balls and puts them over there. You stand at attention and turn if you have to to face the flag for the playing of the national anthem and the introductions at 
when those are complete. It's a good idea for the R1 to find out what the announcer is going to say last so they know when the, when the trigger point is for them to call the teams to the center line. Um, this was different last year during COVID. I'm not sure that the decision is made exactly what the protocol is going to be pre-match this year. Uh, do we know that, Brent, yet? Say that one more time, Kent. Sorry. We know. Are we going to be abandoning the pre, the pro, the uh, COVID protocol from last year, or what we're going to do precisely yet on that? Yes, uh, all, and that will be for all sports. Uh, generally, all COVID protocols are now uh, no longer in effect. Okay, that makes it a lot easier for us. So we're going to call the teams to the center line to shake hands. Uh, and then we'll start the match. As we prepare for the start of the match, then when the teams are called to the center line, the line judges grab their ball, their grab their flags and ball and move to a point approximately 10 feet back of the court on the sideline extended. Hold the flag rolled up in your right hand and the ball in your left hand on your left hip. And if you if you're L1 and have two balls, you have to hold two of them under your arm. R2 is going to check the lineups there and then she's going to go, he or she is going to retrieve the ball from the scores table and roll it to the first server. At this time, we roll, the line judges roll the balls to the shaggers. And that shagger that's on kind of behind R1 should be directly behind the center of the net so they can intercept balls going from one place to the other. As a line judge, you want to stand with your feet straddle the corner about eight to 16 inches from the end line and sideline. You don't want to be close enough that if the ball hits your foot, it could have possibly hit the line. Knees bent up, weight forward on the balls of your feet. That should put your nose directly over the corner that you're observing. You want to hold the flag waist high in both hands. You need to move slightly up and down the sideline and back and forth across the end line to get the best look at the play. Um, but don't move unless there's a necessity to move. And we want to limit that movement to about six to eight feet. If we start moving 10 and 12 feet one way or the other, we have trouble getting back to that corner to make end line and sideline calls that are our major responsibility. Our first responsibility is to call footballs by the server. Note that a server must contact the ball for serve prior to stepping on the end line or onto the foot onto the court. If a football occurs, you wave the flag over your head to get the R1's attention and then point at the serve line. Normally, standing on your corner and just twisting your shoulder slightly is good. You want to watch the line. Uh, if the fervor server starts out near you, uh, one third might be a big line, a kind of a general, general guideline I use. If I could reach out with my flag and touch where the, the, the server is at, then I'm too close. I'm going to interfere. So I'm going to step backwards along the end line extended to give the server room to serve. As soon as that server's room been completed, I want to move quickly back up to the corner because if the ball gets ripped down that sideline, I've got to be able to make that call as to in or out. One of the things that I find is helpful is if that server is real close to the line when they serve, from the R1 standpoint and especially from the opposing coach's standpoint, it looks altogether like it was a football and you're going to hear the coach yelling football. So one of the things we do uh, is just glance at R1 and shake your head, yes, it was a good serve, or shake your head, no, they didn't step on the end line. That lets the R1 know you're observing what happened. You're all over that call. And we shut those coaches up a little bit quicker. Our job is to call balls in and out. This is probably our major responsibility. The line judges are responsible for the lines that extend from the corner that they're at. L1 has these two lines, L2 has these two lines. And while I've got to try and 
see if I can minimize this and get it out of my way so I can see what I'm doing. Okay. While line judges single out on all balls that are with respect to their lines, we don't want to single in always unless they're kind of within this three foot box that extends out of our lines. So for example, all of these balls that are indicated here are out with respect to line judge one. They're all in respect to LJ two, but I don't, we don't want LJ two calling in because it just kind of confuses everybody, especially the, the uh, fans that are in attendance. She, L, the line judge down there called the ball in, how can you call it out? This ball happens to be in with respect to the lines of both of them. So both line judges need to be calling it in. It falls within that three foot range down there. Now, if it comes up the line a long ways uh, towards L1, uh, L2 may not make an in call. Um, but often we're going to make, uh, if it's questionable whether it might have been on the court, down or played up, we'll put the flag down and call it in. If in doubt, if in doubt, make the in call, your line, your R1 will tell you if they want you not to make those calls. We're supposed to call balls at, down on the court. We're supposed to help R1, R2 make that call that if, a, that if a pancake was successful or not. Often one of the line judges is the only set of eyes that can really see. The R1 may be screened by, by players in their way, R2 may be screened or they may be watching the net and not see it. And the other line judge can get screened also. Balls that are down on the court are the call of both line judges on either side of the court. And what I usually tell my line judges is, if you think the ball is down, I need you to make that down call. You're gonna hold it for maybe five or six seconds until I have a chance to maybe come back with you because I have to follow the ball. If I don't come back to you, you're gonna assume that I have a different call than you and you're gonna pick your flag up and we're gonna play on. Line judges also have to call touches. And this is probably one that needs more, that as R1 and R2, we need more help with because there are some of those micro touches at the net are very difficult to see. Thing to remember that we call a touch when the ball lands out of bounds, but it was first touched by the player. Just because the ball is touched at the net by the block, we don't signal touch. That's giving information to the team that they shouldn't have. We have to wait till the ball becomes dead. And instead of calling out, we call touch. Occasionally, the ball may be attacked away from you and land way out of bounds on the other side and the R1 looks at you, they're not looking for an in-out call by you. They're looking for the possibility that you might have a touch. And if you do, you should be signaling it. If not, and they look at you, just simply shake your head side to side and indicate, nope, I have no touch. That touch could occur at the net by the blockers. It could occur in the backcourt as the ball's traveling out of bounds. One of the things to remember is that if the ball is going quickly toward the end line out of bounds and it might be touched, you as a line judge need to get to the line and call the in and out because you have the best look at that and no one else has a good look at a close call back there. Three other sets of eyes have a chance to look at that touch. So if this was happening near your end line, you may have to give that ball up to see if there's a touch because you need to get to the end line and make that in and out call. All the balls that cross the net must cross between the antennas, completely between the antennas. These balls that are indicated here are not crossing the net legally. And so we have an antenna violation, which is signaled by waving the flag to get the R1's attention from point at the antenna. Both line judges are responsible for, for responsible for both antennas. Remember though, that when a ball strikes the top of the net near the other opposite antenna from you, we want that line judge to make that call because it, for, from your standpoint, it looks like the ball hit the antenna 
and we sometimes end up with a phantom violation call by the line judge on the opposite line. I as an R1 or an R2 will never make that antenna violation call on those kind of balls that are close because I have in the past made that call and everybody in the gym knows it was wrong except me. One of the other things we need to remember as line judges is we have to anticipate what might be happening. And this is just like any other ex uh, officiating experience, we've got to have officiated long enough to know what's possibly going to happen. So if the ball is being played on its third, getting ready to be played on the third hit outside the court near the sidelines, it may be beneficial for the line judge to move from her starting position so that we can see the ball coming across the net. For example, if the ball is in the position here on the upper side of the court, travels this way, L1 needs to move down the court so that the antenna is right between you and the ball and you can make that call. Because if you stay on your corner and make that call, follow that dotted line backwards and you're looking right at the opposing coach and you just made a call that went against them and you are wrong. And you will find that out if we had instant replay, they would overturn that one. So we don't want that to happen. If this ball is over here and goes this direction, we want to move down the sideline to make the same kind of call. What we don't want to do is make this movement. That's too far. We can't get back to our sideline. During timeouts and intermissions, uh, during the timeout, the line judge will roll their flags up and move along the perimeter of the court with the L2 or LJ2 moving along their end line first, and then both line judges moving in sync to the position on either side of the official stand and stand at their respective attack lines. It's important that if you're L2, you react quickly because often the team's going to hold their time out right there and you're in the middle of the huddle if you don't move quick enough. Each line judge will stand about one step back from the sideline with their flag rolled up and held in both hands in front of them. With about 15 seconds left remaining in the timeout, there should be a warner, warning of some sort. Uh, at that time, we're going to, line judges are going to nod at each other and move back to their position and reverse their uh, path. Uh, or if both teams, have, teams happen to be ready before the 15 second warning, as the last team starts to break their huddle, you're going to nod and try and get back because we don't want the line judges trying to get their position dictating tempo of the match. So if a timeout is called, this is the way you move. And at the end of the timeout, you move back. During the intermissions of any non-deciding game, both line judges take the same positions and same for footwork as you do during timeouts um, and collect the balls if you're using a if you have shaggers and have balls a ball system we're going to take them back to the uh, table put your flags and balls on the bench because we don't want the balls getting mixed up with warm-up balls take a position behind the table and wait with about oh, oops with about 45 seconds remaining in the initial in the intermission, you go back, get your flag and balls and move to that starting position where you started at the start of the match. Now, there we have new, no new probit, proto, COVID protocols to follow this year, but if we're doing tries and quads and tournaments, you'll find that the protocol, uh, the pre-match protocol is different. You just can't, you don't have time to do all of that. So in timeout, you go there. As soon as the coaches and teams have crossed and that it is clear in front of the table, we move across, put our flags and balls at the table and go. Here's some things that I find important that helpful in being a good line judge. First, you wanna see the call. Anticipates what's gonna happen. Don't become a spectator. Uh, I've seen line judges stand with their weight on their heels, knees locked, and the ball come all of a sudden the ball comes at them and four players are at them and they can't get out of the way. So you need to be in a good athletic position so that you can move if you have to. You call only what you see, don't guess. I think there was a ball that was touched. 
you don't call that. You see, if you see a touch, you call that. Uh, in or out, you really need to make those calls. One of the signals that is, is at our disposal is to place your fists across your chest in an X position with your fists on opposite shoulders. That means that a play, just as a ball was getting ready to hit the court, a player went between me and the ball and I did not see it hit the call, so I have no decision. That doesn't mean I saw it hit the floor, but I can't make a decision. It means I can't, I, the player got in my way. And I tell line judges, if you make that call very often, you're not anticipating enough. You need to anticipate that that's gonna happen and you need to get a good look at it. Don't mimic the other line judges call, call what you see. Then you signal the call. You wanna slap, snap your flag to make that signal. Um, there are often times when the rally is continuing and you're making a signal and you have to get our one's attention and a quick movement and a snap of a flag often does that. Now I wanna sell the call. And to do that, I'm gonna bring my feet together, stand up erect and look at R1 and make good eye contact with R1 so we can communicate with our eyes if need be. Be sure and take an athletic stance and be on the ball use your feet and prepared to move if necessary and react and rule quickly. I can tell you if the ball hits the court and bounces once after it hits the court before you make your call, you are never going to sell that call. Whether it's correct or not, you can't sell it. And usually that happens on the close call. Here's some things to work at. I try to pinch the flag between my thumb and index finger. And so in in, I simply push my thumb to the floor and point that way. If it's out, I'm going to raise my elbow first and then point my thumb to the ceiling and get a good out call. Call should be made sharp and emphatically to sure that R1 can see it. And I want to hold it until R1 awards the point, at which time I just relax and get back matter of factly but not hurriedly to my starting position. I don't snap the flag back after the call has been made. One of the things that's a little bit helpful is if you're trying to see in and out calls, try to look from the inside of the court towards the outside. That way it's easier to see if there's out of bounds space between the ball and the line. Always get your eyes to the line on in out calls and get them ahead so that you're watching the line and you see the fl flight of the ball pass through your field of vision rather than watching the ball and watch the line pass through your field of vision. The same is true with touches. Get your eyes to the blocker's hands early, watch the ball pass through the fingers. And don't jump out of the way to try to be, avoid being hit by the ball, take one for the team. If there are players running at you, get the heck out of the way. We're not, there are three other Officials, two officials on another line judge that can help make calls. You just don't want to interfere with the play. Good luck in your line judging career. And remember, you're a very valuable part of the officiating crew. I have seen matches go south, I think, more on scorekeeping problems and line judging problems than I have on R1 and R2 problems. So don't think you're an unimportant part of the crew. You are a very important part of the crew. And it's getting so that MHSAA and the schools are deciding that that's important and starting to pay officials to stay in line judge. Uh, NCAA has, uh, has for quite a few years now had paid officials as their line judges. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. And that's it. Thank you, Ken. Uh, um, we, uh... Are there any questions or comments uh, from the group for Kent or me, if you have? I don't know if I'll be able to answer them. But. I think it was a perfect presentation. I seldom make mistakes, except when I'm in the band. <laughs> uh, yeah. Debbie, Debbie, you had a question? Go ahead and unmute. Deb, you need to unmute. I can't read lips. Oh, you need to put your glasses on so you can see first. I Got did. <laughs> um, can, can you go over where to stand for the stir again? The yes. line judge 
line judges position when you, we are flagged it, away from you it used to be well, first off if the if the server is more than six feet towards the center of the court i wouldn't move off the corner it's when they get within that six feet to, of you to the side they may be way back doing a jump serve but if they're going to approach the court in that six feet you need to get out of the way used to be as line judges we went behind them the protocol now is to move laterally just step backwards okay. across the end line extended about two steps so that you're not in their field of vision or, or interfering with them okay thank you mm -hmm. any other questions or comments Well, I appreciate, uh, Kent, thank you for your presentation this evening. Thank you for all of you for joining us. Uh, I would uh, recommend that you continue to keep your eyes open for other uh, Officiate Michigan Day, um, I don't have someone jumping on right now, uh, other Officiate Michigan Day uh, presentations. Some will be sport specific. We'll have another volleyball uh, presentation coming soon. Additionally, we'll have a number of general officiating, association, recruiting and mentorship coordinator uh, uh, presentations and so I can and train the trainers. So I encourage you to take advantage of those. These will all be recorded and we will release them on July 31st as a group uh, for our virtual officiate Michigan Day. Uh, if you don't have any further questions, uh, thank you again, Kent. Thank you all for joining us. Have a good night. Brent, just one thing. Do I get residuals every time this is reshown? It, you'll, I'll share mine. Okay, good. 10% of mine. Oh, good. <laughs> Take nice care, job, Ken. We sure okay. appreciate it. Thanks. Take care, everybody. Have a good night and a good start to your seasons. <laughs>